Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, with us on the AMCS Board of Directors training is Sam Shermer. Sam is has been in the insurance business since August of 1983. He is a native of Charleston and is very familiar with our area and um, what's going on in insurance. So, Sam, I think one of the top project, um, topics that people are having and are questioning is what in the world is going on with our um, insurance rates now? So I'm going to turn it over to you. I, 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 Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Helen, for having me. Amanda, thank you for having me. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Sam Shermer, and I have been a nationwide agent for 38 years, and I've been in the business for 40. Um, I'm still a nationwide agent, but um, I am also an independent agent and have been handling um, property insurance uh, since 1983. Went through Hurricane Hugo and all the other storms. And I've been through, we have, all of us have been through a couple of uh, cycles on the, what we call a hard property market. Um, when they say that hard market means that it's hard to find the capacity, it's, it's hard to find the availability, and it's um, a, a tough market and prices increase. And it goes in cycles, but um, right now we're facing probably the worst that I've seen. Um, the property market is what I would call in turmoil. And there's a number of things that drive that. Um, they started about a year or two ago. Um, obviously, we have the weather events. Um, you have the storm that we had to go through Florida down in uh, Fort Myers down that way. Uh, I believe it was Ian. And that was kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, they had a lot of damage, a lot of money. Um, so the, the weather is driving it. Um, large accounts. Uh, if, if you've got a, a, a habitational or a, or even an office building of some sort that's got a lot of value to it and you start talking 20, 30, 40 million, $100 million worth of coverage, um, that's a lot of exposure, <clears throat> exposure in any one place for a storm to roll in there and take it out. Uh, the carriers are also seeking to um, spread out their risk so that it's not all coastal related. Well, the coast is where they're getting hammered. So they like to have stuff that's in Greenville, South Carolina, or they like to have stuff that might be in Tennessee. And then we all look at the television and say, well, they have uh, tornadoes all the time. So which, which, you know, pick your medicine, so to speak. But they do like to spread the risk out. They're trying to do that. Um, and, they, and they are hammering on the rates. They're hammering those that are on the coast and they're easing off a little bit or, or, or not, as, not as heavily on the ones that are inland. Um, uh, we have our, our economy, um, as y'all know, gas is higher, taxes are higher, everything's higher, groceries are higher, uh, the economy, inflation is driving uh, some of it. Um, insurance to value, uh, you'll hear that talked about a good bit. Uh, replacement costs is probably more more, more common uh, phrase. Um, replacement costs. Build. The increased cost to rebuild is so much higher now that they're estimating that they're anywhere from 30 to 40 percent off on the replacement cost on the building. So when they do uh, catch on fire or blow in a hurricane, uh, they're finding that they're underinsured. And uh, on the carrier side, they didn't collect enough premium for the risk. And on the uh, client side, uh, they're sitting there with uh, not enough money to rebuild what they had. The other one that we don't you don't talk about much with the general public is reinsurance. <clears throat> uh, reinsurance is insurance that insurance companies buy. So on a smaller scale, if we all five, five or six of us, 10 of us got together and we all put a million dollars in the pot, we could open up an insurance company in Florida at the drop of a hat. But then we say, well, wait a minute. What if a big old storm comes? I don't want to lose my million dollar investment. So they go out and buy insurance. So that when that storm rolls through there and does, you know, there's different levels, but let's just say it does uh, $250 million worth of damage. The investors that are that run in the insurance company, they can't handle all that. So they purchased reinsurance that says, hey, we'll handle the first $250 million, 
after that, we want the reinsurance to kick in. That's reinsurance. Insurance, insurance for insurance companies. Well, the reinsurance about two years ago sat there and looked at it and said, wait a minute, with all this increase in the values of homes, increase in the value of your condos, increase of your personal homes, whatever you got, it's all increasing and costs more to rebuild it. And we are collecting the same amount of money we did three years ago, but our exposure has risen substantially and we're not making any money. So the reinsurance companies came in and hammered the, when I say hammered, they dropped the bomb on them. They gave them a big old gigantic bill and said, if you want the reinsurance that you bought last year, it now costs three times that or four times that or five times that. And the investors say, oh, we can't do it. So they go out of business. So you've had some personal lines carriers like UPC, St. John's, Lighthouse, FedNAT. You have some of them just fall off the map and no longer operate because they couldn't afford reinsurance and they didn't have the finances to make it work. So financial strength is important, but back to reinsurance, when they bump their rates up, then the carriers are sitting there going, okay, what are we gonna do here? We have to push this over to the, to the client. So what we're seeing is in this hard market is a very, very strong push to get rates up to what they feel is adequate. We're seeing anywhere from 50% to 70%, and I'm seeing some that are 100%. Uh, rate increase from what from what it was last year. Um, it's brutal. Um, it's making it's making everybody scratch their head and go, "What in the world? How we're going to do it?" So we start looking for other ways to reduce that rate. One hundred thousand when they want one hundred and eighty thousand. It's hard to, to negotiate that. Back in the day, we used to be able to negotiate, say, you know, it looks like it's going to be an $85,000 account. Can I get it for 82? And you had that option. You don't have those options anymore. It's all going up. It's not going down. Um, that's what's driving it. That's what the marketplace is doing. It's not a very pretty marketplace. Um, again, that's the worst I've seen in, in, in my, my career um, on homeowners and on commercial um property insurance. Uh, it's, it's, it's across the board. Um, everybody's going up. Everybody's taking rate. Uh, it's not pretty, but that's what's going on in the marketplace. Um, does anybody have any questions about the marketplace or, or have any questions that I'd like to ask me about that? Or do I need to go anything deeper than that? Um, I think that's good, Sam. But, you know, you mentioned about companies dropping out of the market. Um, yes. Two years ago, approximately how many companies did we have, or a different way to ask it is, you know, approximately how many companies have dropped out of our market that we were able to get bids from, let's say, two plus years ago? Uh, upwards of 15. Um, wow. There's been at least 15 carriers that are withdrawn from the marketplace, maybe more than that. Um, when, when I go to market, I might get a summary of 15 companies and I might only have two that are willing to play in the okay. coastal marketplace. Now we go, we get inland, it gets a little bit better, but on the coastal marketplace, uh, they're few and far between. And not only that, but the ones that are here are limiting, limiting capacity. Um, if you needed 32 million, well, I had one the other day that needed uh, over a hundred million. And they were only willing to offer $50 million worth of wind. And so the capacity there from the carriers has been limited and they can't take on all of the risk that they did last year. So some some people are having trouble finding 100% to value coverage, meaning they might only be able to get 80% of coverage or they might only be able to get 50% of coverage. Now, if they want to pay you know, you can build it up. It's called layering and, it, and, it, and the carriers are going to layering instead of one company taking on the whole risk like State Farm taking on $32 million or Nationwide taking on $32 million. They're, they're layering it and that gets into a little bit more complicated stuff. Um, but um, capacity, that's the capacity problem and availability mm -hmm. is the problem. Okay. They're not um, out there so like, nobody, nobody's out there bidding for it. 
it's more like, can I find it? Sure. Sure. So earlier you and I were talking about, because one thing everybody always asks is if I increase my deductible and will that bring my premium down as a temporary until the market readjusts again? Uh, what Explain how that works and um, okay. the risk with that. And if I want to lower my premium back down, what happens in that situation? Will it go back down to where I was before? Um, as, as we all know uh, from our own personal experiences with cars and boats and houses or whatever you own, you can always go to the insurance man and they advertise on television, you know, call us. We can we talk about your deductibles. We'll, you know, ra raise your deductible and reduce your premium. That is very, very normal. But when we get into situations like this along the coast and hard markets like this, they start to deal in what they call a rate per hundred or they come up with a rate that they want and they say this is what we'll offer it at and we said well we want a higher deductible will it change the premium much they've already got it in their mind that they want that um rate to be a dollar or dollar ten or dollar twenty whatever the rate was that they wanted and there have been times where i call even in the past that i call and say hey if i go to a higher deductible they'll say yes but the premium stays the same, and that is foreign and adverse to what we all know. We all are in the world that if you raise your deductible, your premium goes down. It's going to go down. If it goes down at all, it's only going to go down a little bit because they still want to be somewhere in that range of that dollar, dollar ten, dollar twenty. And I'm making that number up just for simplicity. But that's the way that works. We can raise the deductible. Right now, they're they're mandating higher deductibles where, where it used to be 1%, 2%. They're mandating 5% or they're mandating a, a $100,000 minimum win deductible. They're, they're, they're driving the hard market. They're telling us what they'll offer us. And we don't have a whole lot of options there. But it is something that we do address when we go when we go to market. We try to get the best deductible that we can. You can also buy down a deductible if the carrier comes in there and says, hey, I'm only going to offer it at a 10 10, 000, a 10 percent deductible and it doesn't uh, float with a mortgage company or financing. Um, you can buy deductibles down, but that's more premium. That's available. Um, you can you can change the deductible to a higher deductible now. Um, the, the thing about that is, is that when the storm hits that money, you, you'll get a check short that amount of money. So let's say that the deductible is $50,000. Hurricane comes, does lots of damage to the buildings or buildings. And um, y'all, the HOA is sitting there looking at it going, okay, well, we're, we, we, got, we got our money. We know what we got. We know what it costs, but we're $50,000 short because of the deductible. That deductible can be, usually will be assessed to the unit owners. And how y'all handle that, each, each board needs to sit and just determine how you handle all deductibles, and then as you increase deductibles, we need to let everybody know on the um, in the newsletter that y'all may, may or may not send out emails, whatever y'all send out to the unit owners to let them know that it has been done. Because um, anything that y'all make decision wise is like that needs. To sleep, um, but. Um, Usually they, they lock it in and, and changing the deductible, um, you know, doesn't happen often, but it can be done. Yes. Okay. Very good. Um, and then, I'm sorry, I froze there for a second. You may hit this while I froze. But okay. when we go to lower the deductible back down, it's just like it doesn't reduce the premium that much. It won't come down that much either when we lower it, correct? That is correct. Okay. Yeah, so, we, 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 when, when we come back down on the deductible, it, it, when, when we went up on it, it didn't save us much. When we come back down on it, it ain't going to cost us much. But, um, you know, the, the carrier's got to agree to it, too. So some, some of them will get kind of, in this marketplace, they're going to get kind of picky. So be okay. prepared for that. All right. Sam, let's talk about claims. A storm comes through. Um how do how does that need to be handled? How does it work with the insurance company? And then yes. also, if we have a trip and fall, how does that need to be handled? Okay. 
Um, claims is very important, y'all. Uh, your, your claims history, there's a thing called loss runs. Um, I, I might call and ask AMCS to send me loss runs, or they might call and ask for me to send them loss runs. Um, that is the history that your account, uh, your risk, your HOA has had. That's their claims history that they've had over the last five years. It could be nothing on there, or it could be a slip and fall here, a fire there, another a shooting over there, uh, a hurricane over there. You know, that it'll tell us all of that when it happened. It tells us how much was paid out and whether the claim is open or closed. Um, an open claim uh, needs to be settled before we can change carriers or, or change companies by any way, shape, or form. Can't have any open claims, got to be closed. Um, so the history, your, your claims history is very, very important and needs to be protected at every turn. Um, when a claim, when a big hurricane rolls through, it is very, in the past, it's been very normal for the client or the unit owner to say, oh man, it just blew the roof off, blew my window out. I got damage, I got rainwater in here. And they know that State Farm or Nationwide or Allstate was the carrier. And they pick up the phone and they call that night because it happened and it scared them. And they call immediately and file the claim. That is not what we want to happen if we have multifamily uh, situation. We need there to be a gatekeeper and that gatekeeper, whether it's uh, someone on the board or whether it's someone at the property management company, that gatekeeper needs to be the one that everybody calls and says, I had this happen. And the reason for that is to one, keep the, the number of claims to being reported because every time somebody reports a claim, it's gonna show up on that five or that five year loss run. It'll all have the same date, but there'll be six of them. Frequency will get you canceled by a carrier faster than a total loss where the building burnt to the ground. So we wanna make sure that we have a gatekeeper that when those claims happen, all the claims go through the gatekeeper. They have a they have a small grease fire on a, in their uh, in their unit because they they fell asleep and were cooking French fries, and that fire needs to go straight to the gatekeeper to determine is this something that we're going to file? Is it is it a you know huge claim like three hundred thousand dollars worth of damage, or is it a ten thousand dollar claim and we got a five thousand dollar deductible? So or under five or even under five thousand. It's you know it's it just smoked up the place. We got to get somebody in there to clean it. It's going to be about a four thousand dollar bill, but we got a five thousand dollar deductible. That's not we do. That's not, we need a gatekeeper to make sure that those little little claims don't cause us a frequency problem. We don't want a frequency problem. So having a gatekeeper. So when the storm comes, everybody wants to call. They call. Um, let's just say they call Helen and say, "I've got a claim." We'll and Helen and I will, will talk, and the insurance people talk. And then we'll find out whether it's something to report or something not to report based on your particular deductible for your HOA. Um, that's very important. And that comes into play because that when y'all determine what deductible y'all want, that's also what we call self-insuring. You're self-insuring up to that amount. So if it's a $50,000 number or an 80,000 or a hundred thousand, that's what you're self-insuring. And we're not filing any claims for hurricanes or, or, or such underneath that. For a fire, you're gonna have a deductible like a 5,000 or a 10,000 or 2,500. We're not gonna file any, any claims that, the, that it's gonna be under that or just barely over it. Uh, we don't wanna show a claim on the loss runs that was a $5,500 claim. They whacked off the 5,000 and put a $500 claim on there. The other one is slips and falls. Um, Helen mentioned slips and falls. They happen a lot. Um, bodily injury is covered underneath the general liability policy. Um, if someone slips and falls, I believe we had one time someone was walking down the steps and fell off the rail or fell over the rail. Um, you have people fall out windows. You have people have something fall off of the roof. A light fixture might fall off and hit them in the head. Um, you have shootings. People pull out a gun and shoot somebody. Uh, all these things come into play. and when those things happen, usually I like to be advised of it. Um, I get an incident report from the property management company telling me that um, this happened, but we're not ready to file a claim yet. 
And then um, I say, okay, and I mark it in my file and whenever they're ready to make the claim or they get suit papers. If you're on the, on the board of directors and you get suit papers, the first person you need to send the suit papers to is the property manager. And the second person you need to send it to is me or the insurance person because failure to notify can cause a lot of problems. So don't sit on it. Don't stick it in the If you get a suit, suit papers, it needs to be a handle and it needs to be handled immediately. Um, we do cover the slips and falls, uh, but we need to know about them and we need to try to make sure that you're always looking at your property. The HOA needs to be looking at the property to make sure that uh, you all have taken as, as much care of the property as you can. Um, one of the ones that I like to tell a story, an example is um, my the client or the, the, the person making the claim was walking through in the evening, uh, the evening dark, and a snake was on the sidewalk or in the grass and it scared her and she fell down and hurt herself trying to get away. So she sued and we said, how can we be, how can we be responsible for an animal or a snake, a coyote coming out of the woods and scaring somebody and they trip and fall over their own feet? How can we be, um, how can we, how can that happen? So we were prepared to go to court. Almost, they, they picked a jury. They were excited. They said, oh, we're up here in Berkeley County. We got a good jury. They're, they understand snakes and coyotes and, and animals. And it's going to be great. They got into court. And immediately, the first thing basically out of the other guy's um, mouth was, this isn't about the snake. This is about improper lighting. So just about any of us, anywhere I own my property here where I am, any of us can be sued for just about anything. And if they can't find a good reason, they just say, nah, improper lighting. And off they go to the races to try and sue you. Now, whether they get paid or not is a whole nother ball game, but usually it's a settlement and it goes on your five year loss history and you have to deal with that for the next five years. So if we can, uh, we call them frivolous. If we can get away from, if we can be prudent, and use good common sense in all of our decision making, then that goes a long way in court. And it helps if we go that far. But before we even get to court, it helps with loss control and making sure that we don't have a bad loss ratio or have bad history on our loss runs that I explained earlier. So Is Sam, that good, good, good enough, Helen? It does. But you know, to take it a little bit further, if someone files a lawsuit. And we notify the insurance company because it's always generally more money than the HOA has in the bank. Um, and the insurance company's taking care of it. Does the HOA, once it's turned over to the insurance company, have any control over how much it might be settled for or if it's settled? Yeah. So what Helen's getting at is that a, a lot of times when you buy insurance and uh, you have a claim, you want to be up to date, you want to be there every minute to make sure that the decision that's being made goes the way you want it to go. And it really, in real life, it doesn't work that way. The attorney sue, as soon as the suit comes in and the claim is filed, the insurance company hires uh, their own insurance uh, uh, attorneys to handle the claim. And they're to protect your interest, but they're also sitting there going, okay, I got a million dollars sitting over here and this, uh, this other attorney is after it. How do I keep him from getting the full million? Now, if it's a, a, a fatality, they probably gonna get the full million. But if it's a small claim, like somebody slipped over uh, a rock or, or fell down on their own, then they don't keep us up to date. They don't keep me as the agent. They don't keep the property manager. They're not gonna keep the HOA they're going to go in there and try to settle that claim. And they might go all the way up to the doorsteps of the courthouse and then turn right around and go, okay, I'll give you $50,000. And they say, thank you. And everybody turns around and goes home. There's not any uh, calls to the HOA president saying, hey, we're getting ready to do this. Now, there have been some calls when um, certain situations where they might call and say, we're getting ready to settle this for $25,000. Do you want us to go ahead and settle it, make this go away, or would you like us to do X, Y, Z? Sometimes that happens. It's not that it doesn't happen, but typically 
the insurance attorneys are trying to protect you, one, two, not pay out the full po policy limits if possible. Um, and, and if it's unnecessary. And, and those decisions don't involve the HOA board. So Sam, if an HOA has done everything that they can to keep something from happening, they're being very diligent in their responsibilities, the pool's not open yet, it's chained closed, and somebody jumps the fence to go swimming because it's beautiful like the days we're having right now. And when they jump that fence, they break their ankle. They were trespassing on our property because let's say they're not even an owner. They're trespassing on our yeah. property. They jump something that we have closed. Can they sue us for something like that? Yes. Whether they pay it or not is, 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 is one thing, but yes, they will. Uh, when we get those lawsuit papers, everybody, it's not optional whether we file it or not. Once those file it, so the FYI that it happened is we sit on it. We look, we uh, 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 but when those when those lawsuit papers come in, we have to we have to file that claim right then. It's going to go on the loss run. There's no if, if ands about it. But that's the defense. When you pay for that general liability policy, you're paying for somebody to defend you. So when that person jumps that fence, he's not supposed to be there. We can't make it go away because he's going. His family is going to sue. Like if they jumped in the pool and drowned, the the family's estate is going to sue, and we'll have to respond to it. We can't. We can only do like I said earlier. We can only do what's prudent, and we can only do what the common sense person would do. And that's what the judge is going to look at. Now, I'm not an expert on the legal side, but everything that that I read or know is that's those are the first two principles that they're going to look at. And it, were, were you taking good care of your If you've got the fence and you've prepared the fence, you know, you, and how do you prevent a shooting? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's beyond me how you can prevent one. You can't, but those, yeah. things, those things happen. You're going to get sued. All right. <laughs> We're trying our hardest not to. So one yeah. of the other and, things... And, as you mentioned earlier, is the prices of everything has gone up. Um, how often should talk about insurance values, keeping them where they should be and what needs to be done? Certainly. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's one of the things that is driving uh, the issues with the insurance carriers is the, we call it underinsured, uh, insurance to value, replacement cost. Um, as a board, we talk about it as replacement cost or reconstruction cost is what we talk about. Um, you pick a, you, you, when you buy insurance, you put a value on the building. Um, back in the day, it might only cost $55 a square foot to build a building. Now that number is really, really much higher than that. It's all over the board, but it's probably way above 200 a square foot at a minimum. Uh, maybe higher. Um, but anyway, we have to make sure that we have the right amount of coverage on the buildings. Um, not only to protect or to make sure that the insurance and all works right, but the unit owner is going to want that unit. If there's four units in the building, they're going to want that unit rebuilt. And we don't want it to be underinsured and look at those four owners and go, oh, well, we had the building underinsured and you're all going to have to come out of pocket for $400,000. They're not going to be happy. They're going to want to sue somebody. Um, we want to make sure that we have the uh, ability to rebuild. I, I call it when the rubber hits the road and it's burnt to the ground and you come in and you're sitting in the office looking at me across the desk and you go, hey, everything burned up last night. I don't know how much coverage I had. What do I have? And whatever number I tell you, I say, you got 500,000. If, if, that, if that's enough for you, then I'm OK with it as long as the insurance company carriers are OK with it. But right now, all of the insurance carriers are trying to bump that number up. They're looking at it and going, okay, you had it at a million. We want 1.3 million. You know, I don't want 1.3. Well, you're going to have to have 1.3 and they're not going to play ball. Um, replacement cost on the buildings, it needs to be done. I would recommend every three to four years. 
some some say three to five. Um, but with the way things have been going, everybody's underinsured because we can't rebuild it at what we had it for in the last couple of years. So to be prudent, everybody needs to do some serious um, work on replacement costs slash reconstruction costs. Now, right. let me talk. Let me talk re re replacement. I, I use I use the two almost in the same phrase or same sentence, but I want to make sure we understand replacement costs. I don't know about buying a car. You've heard, you know, I bought my new car. I went down and had an accident at the first stoplight. I paid $20,000 for the car. I went to the first stoplight, had an accident. And they only want to, the insurance company only wants to give me $17,000. That $3,000 drop was the actual cash value depreciation. The carrier took depreciation. Most of your properties, I don't know, know many that, are, that, are not, that aren't, are settled on a replacement cost settlement basis. That's a claims settlement word. We are settling the claim on a replacement cost basis as opposed to an actual cash value basis, aka depreciation is taken. We're not taking depreciation. We're replacing it. So the roof blows off. It costs $40,000 to put the roof on. It's replacement cost. We take the deductible and write you a check for the rest of it. No depreciation. Reconstruction cost is a whole nother ball game. Reconstruction is how much is it going to cost me to rebuild that building? So we come up and we say, we want $2 million on that building. We're going to pay, if it burns to the ground, we'll pay the $2 million minus the deductible, not take any depreciation. But the problem is, wait a minute, it's going to cost me 2.5 to rebuild it. That needs that, that space needs to be fixed and it's fixed. Not by saying I want replacement costs, like I'm going to buy $2 million, but if it burns down, I want 2.5. That doesn't work that way. They'll pay replacement cost settlement up to the $2 million. If you need 2.5, we need to make an adjustment. We can do a midterm adjustment. We can do it at the renewal. We can do it at the very end almost. We can do it first, second, third quarter. But it needs to be adjusted. And you go, well, why? Well, I had Atlantic appraisals or I had. Valbridge, do a replacement cost guide, a reconstruction cost estimate. Reconstruction cost estimate on my building, and they tell me it's 2.5. Please bump mine to 2.5. I had a client just the other day. They did that, sent me the documents, and I bumped it to 7 million. 7 million on each building, 7 million per building, and away we go. Um, so that's, that's the part that will need to be documented on the HOA minutes that y'all talked about it, y'all discussed it, y'all got a second, a third opinion, um, and you, you, you did due diligence to determine that you had the right amount of coverage on the building, regardless of price, because price comes into play. But if there's documentation that y'all sat there and voted on it and said, well, we really don't want to go to 2.5 because it's going to cost us an extra $100,000, that's not good stuff to have in the minutes when one of the unit owners is suing for that extra $500,000. It's not, it's not a good spot to be in. So we got to be prudent. We have to make sure that we have the replacement cost guides. There's a number of ways to do that. Um, one of them is, is to hire um, one of the appraisal companies to do a re uh, market value. We all know is what we could sell the house for sell your home for today um but that includes land value and, and, and what the market stands not what it costs to actually build it and they're two different numbers okay so sam if there is a loss on the building itself and let's say it's older and the kitchens were originally built with flamica countertops but you know now we have granite that's easily acceptable you know accessible um, we used to have thin contractor grade carpet. Now we can do hardwoods and all of these synthetic, synthetic lam laminates and stuff. If it was valued and based on what it was built with, how are those overages for the upgrades, so to speak, handled? Okay. 
um, the bylaws come into play, everyone. Uh, Y'all are familiar with the bylaws of the HOA, some, some called covenants and bylaws. Um, that's going to dictate uh, what's going on. Now, this is not a, the value is on the building. And then it gets down to, okay, are we going to build the building back with the interior walls, with the sheetrock? Or is it going to look like a, a, a just studs and insulation and electrical wires? One's called referred to as all in and the other one's all walls out. So if it's walls out, when you have a fire and they have to rebuild your building and it's walls out, that'd be just the shell of the building. You would open the door and you would be looking at insulation and wiring. And you, as the unit owner, would be responsible for putting back the sheetrock, the trim, the bathroom, the kitchen, the kitchen counters, the kitchen cabinets. Um, bathrooms are very expensive to put in. You know, just a room, square room with a whole hardwood floor is one thing. But boy, when you start putting a bathroom in there, that's a lot more money. And the unit owner may be responsible for that, depending on how the bylaws are written. You know, we'll come back to the bylaws in a minute if if if, if Helen reminds me. But the, so what I want y'all to know is that each unit owner should have an HO6 condominium apartment unit owner's policy, um, townhouse or, or condo. They call it an HO6 policy. Uh, all of the insurance agents sell them. You can call your local agent and say, I need an HO6. But the main thing is to make sure that you have one. It is very common that when we have a large storm, that someone in the HOA picks up the phone and says, what, what, HO6? I don't know what that is. I thought I had insurance because it's on my invoice that y'all sent me from my regime dues. I thought I already had insurance. No, we have insurance on the building. And depending on the bylaws, either it covers the way it was built or it covers just walls out. It's just a shell of the building and you would have to go in and put all the other stuff in. So if you are responsible for putting everything back in, how do you cover that? The HO6 usually just says, how much do you want for contents? You say, well, when I pulled up with the U-Haul, I had, you have to come up with it. And I, I don't, there's no way for me to tell, but you just give me a number. You say, ah, I had $50,000 worth of stuff in that U-Haul. So, okay. So everything you moved into the apartment when you bought the, the, the condo, when you bought it, you had 50,000. Yep. Do you want any coverage on the dwelling? That really, there's, there's other words for it. Dwelling, betterments and improvements, additions and alterations. Those are three words for the same thing when you're talking an HO6 condo or townhouse policy. So it might say dwelling and might have, so you, you would come up with a number. And I, I said, well, you know, put a bathroom in and put this in. I think I think you need a seventy five to hundred thousand dollars. OK, so you, you do the seventy five thousand. So now you got seventy five thousand on the put everything back in the walls and all. And you got fifty thousand to put all of the contents, beds, things like that. But anything that's nailed down or cannot be removed will probably go underneath the building. Uh, a refrigerator that's just slid into the slot. Eh. It could, it could probably go either way, depending on how the adjuster looks at it. But let's just say, because you can move it out and put it on the truck, that's going to go under contents. The flooring, you can't take that with you. The flooring is going to go, excuse me, the flooring is going to go into um, the building coverage. So you would have $75,000 you have 75,000, excuse me, $75,000 to put all that stuff back in. Everybody needs to have one. The HO6 also covers liability. You have a friend coming over for Friday night cocktails. He slips and falls, bumps his head. No problem. He gets taken care of. But then the next thing you know, his daughter is suing you. She talked him into suing. We're going to fix that. Something's wrong with my phone. I apologize. But the liability is also um, taking, uh, taking care of liability. And there's a little piece in there called med pay, but that doesn't come into play a bunch anymore. Um, but liability is very important. That's, that's a dog bite. If you got any dogs, uh, most of them, sometimes, most of the times it covers it, but some companies have sub limits in there. that says we don't cover it or we only cover it for 25,000. So watch out for that. 
deductibles. Right. One other thing, Helen, I need to speak. Deductibles. What do you do about the deductible and loss assessment? There's a coverage in there called loss assessment. Um, the way to look at loss assessment is whatever happened to the master policy. Was it a fire? Was it a lightning strike? Was it a hurricane? Was it a tornado? Was it a water leak? Was it an earthquake? What happened with the master? Whatever happened, if you pull that cause of loss and say, is it covered underneath my HO6? Then loss assessment applies. The, the, you can file a claim for the loss assessment. So an example of loss assessment on a fire would be, and we had uh, $200,000 to pay for the fire claim, but we had a deductible and, or we had, we were short for some reason. They couldn't pay for something. Then you say, oh, you go over to the HO6. Hey, I've been assessed by my HOA, State Farm. Will you pay this loss assessment? They look to see if it was covered peril. If it's covered peril, they pay the loss assessment. So I would recommend that all of you have a loss assessment of in excess of $5,000. Now, let's say you get an assessment because the landscaping went up. Okay, got a loss assessment. You carry it over there to the State Farm Bowl and you go, hey, I got this loss assessment for landscaping. And he looks at it and goes, wait a minute. Just because your landscaping went up, that doesn't mean that it wasn't, it wasn't, that's not a covered peril under the master policy. That was just one of the vendors bumping up their rate. That's not what loss assessment's for. The last part of loss assessment is some companies, some companies will allow you to take that big deductible that you purchased on your master policy, assess it out to the unit owners. So I own a unit and I got an assessment for $4,000 for the deductible because we had such a big deductible on the master policy. I take that to the state, take, take that to my insurance man. And I say, hey, I got this loss assessment for the deductible. And then they go, well, what was it for? Oh, it was for the windstorm. Windstorm is covered. Windstorm is covered under the HO6. Yes, we'll pay it. And they'll pay up to whatever number you have, whatever coverage you chose. That's why I'm telling you, not, don't let it be a thousand. That's just a little bit. For pennies on a dollar, you can get 5,000. You might be able to get 10. You might be able to get 25,000 loss assessment on your HO6. And Ask, ask them if it covers the deductible that's being assessed after the master policy, because some don't, some do. Very important. Okay. So if there is a loss and I have a tenant in my unit and they have to move out for the building to be rebuilt, is there insurance for me to recoup my loss of rent? No. Okay. Is there insurance that way to help? I'm, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, Helen. <laughs> so the tenant has nothing. The tenant has nothing. So the tenant is on his own. He should have bought a renter's policy and he would be filing a claim over with his company over there. So there's nothing there for that. If there was a fire and the cause of loss is a covered peril underneath your HO6, there may be some loss of rents underneath your HO6 that would reimburse you, the unit owner, for the loss of rents that you are incurred because of the fire. Yes. No to the to the tenant. Yes to you. All right. Very good. Um, Sam, if the, if an association knows that it, let's say, needs to replace this roof on a building, and they just are saving the money, they don't want to do a special assessment, and they say, okay. The increase we just put into effect by next year, we'll be able to replace that roof. But unfortunately, the hurricane comes in and takes our roof off before we're able, and we know that it's not a 100% roof. Um, what are the dangers of deferred maintenance and not doing maintenance for one reason or another? Um. The, the roof uh, on all buildings right now is a very, very hot subject. Down in Florida, they're facing a, um, they're, saying they're facing some of the same stuff that we're facing, but they have, have been facing for the number of years, a insurance crisis because of the roofing industry 
going and telling um, everyone that, hey, you've got damage to your roof and let me handle it and I'll handle it and I'll, do, uh, I'll sign this piece of paper. That has devastated the Florida market. So what did that do is that made all of the carriers up and down the seaboard be very, very uh, scrutinizing of any uh, claims on a roof. Now, if a hurricane comes, we know we had a hurricane yesterday. It did all kinds of damage. The fear that we need to watch out for is if the roof has already exceeded its useful life. They get out there and they go, wait, a I just replaced my roof on my house. I put it on in 1993. We had a March, the century, storm of the century in March of 93. I put a shing all the roof shingles blew off. I put a new roof on, insurance company paid most of it. And I've had that same roof since 1993. And if I had had a claim or tried to make a claim on that roof, that adjuster was going to come out of there and go, when did you put the roof on? I was 1993. Uh, well, Sam, that thing was so old and the sun had cooked it so much. He says, you know, you didn't have anything for us to, to pay for. And they'll deny a claim on, 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 uh, if they call it, I think they call it obsolete. You know, it, 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 had, it had outlived its useful life. Uh, like you got an old sofa in the, in the, in the garage and you have a fire and the old sofa, the dog's been sleeping on it. They're not going to give you a new sofa because it was already obsolete and, and it was already used its useful life. So you got to be careful for that. Uh, and some carriers are putting um, what they call warranties in the policy that say if your roof is older than 12, 12 years old, 15 years old, different carriers do different things. Um, if, 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 if it's older than 12 years old, it's actual cash value. Now you're into a claim settlement where they're going to take depreciation. Now they're going to say, well, that roof, or like, let's use my example, Sam, that roof was 30 years old. By the time we depreciate it, you know, we only owe you $2,000 and you got a $5,000 deductible. That's what happens with, the, with that. So be careful on the roofs. Once again, we have to be prudent. We have to use common sense and we have to make sure that we're doing that and exercising that as a board member. All right. Excellent information because unfortunately that happens. It happens in, you know, single family homes and with multifamily. So we do Absolutely. have to watch that. Um, does anyone who is um, watching today have any questions? If you do, please raise your hand. Uh, we'll turn your mic on. Um, I know Sam and I can talk about this all day long because we we live it every single day. So, you know, there are so many different things that happen. Um, um, Y'all, well, just to throw some stuff out there that might be helpful to everybody, whether it be personal lines or, or commercial lines. I tell everybody, you know, you know, we talk about the house and we talk about the coverages, blah, blah, blah. And, I, and before I finish up with everybody, I always say, listen, there's a couple of things that I've learned over my years in, in business that you got to watch out for with insurance. And there's a lot, but these are the main two that jump out at me. One is we don't cover anything right. So windows that are rotten, uh, bathroom floors, every morning we step out in the shower, water's dropping off of us. We get water on the floor every morning and eventually it gets up in there, rolls up underneath the shower pan or whatever, or a leaky shower pan. Whatever reason, watch out for rot. Personal lines, commercial lines, it doesn't matter. And then on the personal line side, when you talk to your insurance man, Make sure you've got the addition, the, 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 the dwelling coverage for your HO6. Make sure you have the liability at at least 300000 And make sure you have any valuables such as jewelry watches and furs, guns, cameras, tools. I don't have a lot of jewelry, but uh, my wife didn't have a whole lot of jewelry, but I got a bunch of guns. Um, so I make sure that I insure the guns. Um, I've got some clients that have large collections of coins, large collections of jewelry. And, and we specifically insure that. Why? Losing it, you bumped your hand at the grocery store and the diamond fell out. Losing it is not a covered peril. Remember I was talking about, is it a covered peril over here? And is it a covered peril over there? Well, losing it is not a covered peril anywhere. 
So if you lose that diamond ring, you don't have any coverage unless you specifically insured it. And it can be a rider or it can be a policy by itself. Those are two things that jump back at me as, as you know, I want to help everybody, but then it comes back and, it, and they're not, and so my client's not happy. It's because they didn't know that rot wasn't covered and they didn't know that they had to do something with that jewelry. Very, very important. Excellent information because, you know, I personally thought if I knocked the diamond out of my ring at the grocery store, insurance was going to cover it. So good to know. Luckily, it's insured. Yep. Miss Gina needs more jewelry. Um, yeah. I don't see. <laughs> I don't see any hands up. Um, I know that Sam has thrown a lot out today in a little bit of time. If you're thinking back on this, um, and you come up with questions, please let us know. Uh, we'll get the questions to Sam to get him to answer it for you. We can go to your specific insurance agents for this. Um, we appreciate everybody being here today. Sam, thank you for your time. And I um, want to wish sure. everybody a good weekend. Thank you. Thank, thank you all for having me. I enjoyed it. Thank you. All right, Sam.